Okay, it's time to get started, and Jason has agreed to lead us in a prayer. Bow with us. Let's go to God in prayer. Our glorious, amazing, wonderful Father, Lord, we're so thankful that you are God, and that you love us more than we truly can understand, Lord. Help us to return our love unto you, Lord, because you have in so many ways, more ways than we can truly know about, but most importantly, through your Son and through his sacrifice. Lord, we thank you that you are perfect in everything you do, and that you've given us your perfect word to learn by. Father, help us tonight as we do study your word, as we study about Priscilla and Aquila, that uh, we will learn from them. And Lord, help us to always look to your word to see all the good and bad people that we can learn from them to be better Christians, to be better followers of you, to learn from their lives. We thank you, Lord, that we have it. Please be with your as he teaches us tonight and guide us all in the way that we think and make sure we're doing it according to your ways and we'll be right with you. Lord, in your son's wonderful name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. One of the reasons I picked him is because everybody can hear it. I love that nice, crisp, clear voice. Okay. <clears throat> so we will start with Aquila and Priscilla, which has a really nice cadence to it. Had a New Testament teacher that tried to change it to Aquila and Priscilla, and that just messed up everything. <laughs> um, but of course, we don't know who's right, so we'll just roll with Aquila because that's what everybody says. Time frame nearing the end of Paul's second missionary journey. Now, if you have that uh, timeline of Paul that I gave you all in an earlier class, this might be a handy time to look at it. Um, a lot of things are happening historically right at this time, and uh, there's a lot going on in the in the missionary work of Paul and those surrounding him, uh, and that will help you find this in the greater time frame of his life, but also in the time frame of the Roman emperors. Um, Paul had just left Athens in Acts chapter 17, uh, which is also in Achaia, and he came to Corinth about A.D. 52, and I'm referencing that timeline here. If you don't have it with you and you want to look at it, there's still some copies back here on the table, uh, but I'm not twisting your arm. Claudius had recently been expelled, had recently expelled all the Jews from Rome, and that will actually show up in our text tonight. Uh, and that helps, to, helps us to, to nail down the date pretty closely uh, for some reasons that will soon become evident, I think. In Acts chapter 18, um, the, these are the, the texts that will include something about Aquila and Priscilla. Uh, the, the Jews were expelled from Rome by Claudius, and then they went with, <coughs> Priscilla and Aquila went with Paul from <coughs> Corinth to Sincrea to Ephesus. And I'll show you where those places are in re relationship to one another in a minute. That happened at about AD 52. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19, they were with Paul, probably at Ephesus, when he wrote the letter to the Corinthians and sent greetings. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila sent greetings to the church at Corinth. And then Romans chapter 16, apparently they were back in Rome because Paul sends greetings to them and the church that was in their house, the assembly in their house. And that was made possible because Claudius, who had expelled the Jews in uh, 52, died in 54 and was replaced by Nero. And Nero hadn't turned against the Christians yet, so he hadn't expelled anybody, and he overturned the, the uh, demand of Claudius that they not be there. In 2 Timothy chapter 4.19, then, finally, this is the last of those four letters. And the reason that they appear in the order that they do is because we believe that this is the order in which those letters were written. First Acts, then First Corinthians, then Romans, and then 2 Timothy being among the last letters that Paul ever wrote. So this is about ten years later, almost. Timothy's told to greet them, Priscilla and Aquila, while he was probably at Ephesus. That is, Timothy. Um, and Paul was writing from Roman prison. So they had done a switcheroo and Priscilla and Aquila are no longer in Rome. Now they're in Ephesus and Paul is writing from Ephesus to Rome or for writing from Rome back to Ephesus. Okay, so here's the map and uh, I was just talking to Bruce how maps are 
either made for print or they're made for um, PowerPoint, more for print than for PowerPoint. And when you take a map and you <coughs> digitize it and put it onto PowerPoint, suddenly you can't read any of it anymore. But as you can see, there's the Italian boot over there on the left-hand side of your screen. And Achaia that hanging down here. This is all Greece now, Macedonia, Epirus, and Achaia. Corinth and Athens are both in Achaia. And then Ephesus is over here in Asia, which of course is modern day Turkey. Now, Aquila at least, and perhaps Priscilla also, was from Pontus, which is a region under the Black Sea. Pontus is the word for sea in Roman, so uh, in Latin. So this uh, body of water right before you, you get up to the Black Sea is referred to as propontus. It's before the, before the sea. And uh, so Pontus is that area goes extends for quite a way around, uh, around the Black Sea and was combined uh, due to conquest by Pompey into one province with another called Bithynia. Pont it's called Pontus Bithynia or Pontus et Bithynia in Latin. And uh, so that was the area that, uh, that uh, Aquila came from. And we don't know if Priscilla was a, a native of Pontus or not. He might have met her in Italy. Uh, or somewhere else along the line because apparently Apollos is one of these guys that gets around. Okay, so they were at Rome, had been at Rome when we first meet them, that, so they had made that trek at least, and then when we meet them with Paul, they're at Corinth in, in Acts chapter 18 where our text picks up this evening. Then they went with Paul to Ephesus and stayed there while Paul continued the completion of his second journey and then apparently at some point had gone back to Rome at which time Paul wrote the letter to the church at Rome and then back to Ephesus at which point Paul wrote the letter to uh, the second letter to Timothy so this was a well trodden area for Willa and Priscilla Three focal points of what we're going to talk about tonight are what do we know about them, who were their acquaintances and associates, and I, I got a big aha out of this when I found out just how well connected they were in all of these different groups, which means that all of these groups were at least from one degree of separation were well acquainted with one another. And what can we learn from them? And I'll ask you all to chime in, especially when we get to that section. Since we're going to be spending quite a bit of time in Acts chapter 18 tonight, I want to pick somebody in the back of the room who can really speak up and read for us um, Acts chapter 18 and just read the whole chapter, please, nice and loudly. Brother Pace, can you do that for us? After these things, Paul departed and departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he, became, and he came with them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for by occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul, constrained by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood is upon your own head, and I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Joseph. Who, one who worshiped God, who passed with next door to the synagogue. And uh, Christmas, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, 
for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Now when Galileo was pro council of Acadia, the Jews who with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the justice judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. <coughs> and when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crime, O Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names in your own law, look to it yourself, for I do not want to be judged of any matters, of, any, of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks from uh, Suthis, the ruler of the synagogue, and, uh, beat, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Galileo took no notice of these things. So Paul still remained a good while, and then he took leave of the brethren and sailed from Syria to, with Priscilla and the uh, They were with him. And he had, uh, he had his hair cut off in Serene, for he had, had taken a vow. And he came to Ephesus and with them there uh, but he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And when they asked him to stay a little a, a longer time with them, he did not consent. But he took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed in Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over to the region of Galatia and uh, Perga in order to strengthen the disciples. Okay, now, let's just, I'll just stop you right there. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. We won't, yeah. we'll, we'll not get into Apollos too much until we get uh, further on in the class. Thank you. That was very clear. All right, so I've just jotted down a few points that we've learned about these two. <laughs> uh, their husband and wife, verse 2. Priscilla is a diminutive form of Prisca, and so you'll have see her referred to from time to time by Paul as Prisca. That's actually her, what you would think of as her formal name. Uh, apparently she didn't take herself too seriously because she allowed herself to be referred to by the diminutive form, like little Prisca, Priscilla, more often than she did by Prisca. Uh, so it's kind of a term of affection. They were, uh, he was a native of Pontus. It's not clear whether she was or not. Paul was forbidden to go to Pontus. Uh, the Lord prevented him from going. He said, stay here. I have many people in this city. But in back in chapter 16, the Lord specifically spoke to him and told him, don't go there. A lot of speculation as to why that might have been. It could be because Peter spent a lot of time there. And uh, we have reference to uh, Peter having been in Pontus um, in First Peter, in the first couple, uh, First Peter chapter one, the first couple of verses, and Paul didn't go, as we know, where other people had laid the groundwork. He went to his own places, and he made a point of that on two separate occasions. He said, "I didn't build on anyone else's work, so that no one say could say that I robbed them." Okay, so he had been in Italy until he was expelled with all the Jews by the two of them had been in Italy until expelled with all the Jews by Claudius. It says so specifically in verse two, so that helps us to date the chapter. Met with Paul in Corinth in verse two. They were tent makers with Paul in verse three. They were met by Silas and Timothy arriving from Macedonia. So you see we're starting to form those connections, the people that they knew. They, they know some rock stars in the early Christian movement, don't they? Um, Silas and Timothy, Paul and Silas, Paul and Timothy. You always hear those names together. Well, you can add Priscilla and Aquila to that group. Paul taught in the synagogue in verse 4 and was not real, well received. He went to a nearby house of a worshiper of God named Titius Justus in verse 7. 
Crispus and his, his whole household were believed and were baptized in verse 8. The Lord instructed him to stay there and teach, which he did for about a year and a half. The Jews attacked him. Paul brought, was then brought before the tribunal under Gallio, and presumably they saw all this happen. They, they were probably there right there with him because they were his traveling companions for a good long time after this. Um, and under Gallio, and that uh, within a year or two, we kind of know when Gallio was proconsul of, of Asia. So this also helps us to date it very closely to this time frame. Um, he was accused of leading people away from the law of Moses by the Jews. Well, Gallio is a Roman. What does he care about Jewish laws and customs? And so he just dismisses the whole matter. He refused to hear it. He says, you see it to, see to it yourself. So Sosthenes, who we don't really know what position he held in all this, except that he was the ruler of the synagogue after Crispus, apparently. You know, when we started this, we said Crispus was the ruler of the synagogue, but he and his whole household were converted. So presumably he must have been thrown out of his position and replaced by Sosthenes. And now we have Sosthenes who's standing by when Paul's being accused by the Jews and he's taken out and beaten. So is Sosthenes now a Christian, the second ruler of the synagogue, the same synagogue now a Christian? Don't know. We do know that there is a Sosthenes mentioned in some of Paul's other letters. He, he uh, refers to Sosthenes as being with him on one of his trips and perhaps even in prison. So um, this could be the same Sosthenes who has also converted, but uh, Maybe you wouldn't anticipate, as I wouldn't, that Sosthenes would be a fairly common name at that time. So it might not be the same guy. Um, so they beat poor Sosthenes, and um, Aquila and Priscilla accompanied Paul then to Sencrea. Now, on that map, I showed you where Corinth is. And it's just a very short distance from Corinth over to the coast and that's where Sincrea is located. Corinth is not a port city, but Sincrea is. And so they traveled a short distance over to Sincrea so that they could board a ship to go across the Aegean Sea to Ephesus. And I showed you where Ephesus was across the sea from, from Corinth. So uh, what do we know about Sincrea? Where have we heard that um, city before? Just last week, Seth told us that somebody was from there. Who was it? Phoebe. Phoebe was from Sincrea, okay? So we can add this to the list of connections. It's quite likely that um, at this time, Priscilla and Aquila, along with Paul, would have met and known Phoebe. Um, and she'll be referenced again, as we said it last week in, or early this week in Romans 16. So they accompanied Paul to Ephesus. <laughs> And they remained there but when Paul left. So he left them behind in Ephesus. I don't know if that was Paul's idea or theirs, but uh, they stayed there for whatever reason. And then they met Apollos at Ephesus. And that's where we see the, see the story um, sort of terminate with Paul and pick up with Apollos at verse 24. And it says they instructed him more accurately in the way of God. And then Priscilla and Aquila disappear from the record until they're addressed by Paul in, in Romans chapter 16. So I'm skipping now to Romans chapter 16 so we can see a little bit about what we learn from them there. At this time, Paul is on his third journey. He's already been back to Caesarea. Then he went and spent some time in Antioch. And Antioch was often the springboard onto into the, these missionary journeys. So Paul goes back to Antioch, spends some time there, and then he heads out on his third missionary journey. And this is where Paul is when he's writing the letter to the Romans. And uh, Nero had ascended the throne in 54. So that means Aquila and Priscilla are all clear to go back to Rome, which apparently they did, because Paul greets them there in his letter in chapter 16 and verse 3. 
He refers to them as my fellow workers in Jesus Christ. That's how he refers to Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Jesus Christ. And he says in verse 4, they risk their lives or they risk their necks for my life. They subjected themselves to the sword, in other words, in his place. And they were thanked, and this is also a hint as to how well these two got around, thanked not only by Paul, but also, Paul says, by all the churches of the Gentiles. Wow, that's, that's pretty big. So they must have accompanied Paul for quite a while on his journeys, if, if Paul can say that about them. So Paul asked the Romans to also greet the church in their house. So when they'd gone back to Rome, they'd gotten together what we might refer to now as a house church. They had a, a group meeting in their home. Um, and the word church, of course, is the same as the, the word assembly. If you read it in Greek, it's the word assembly. So it's the assembly in their house. <clears throat> so people connections, a whole bunch, right? Even what we know, and there's a lot more that we don't know. They knew the brethren at Corinth, clearly. They were met by Silas and Timothy, arriving from Macedonia. They presumably were with him to meet Titius Justus and Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, and Gallio, the proconsul of Achaia. So they, they met a pretty high Roman. If the proconsul would have been the second highest uh, ruler in a province in the Roman Empire. Under the emperor, you would have a consul, a consul who was Really, you had to be a proconsul first and be elevated to the point, point of consul, and only a few people ever achieved that. And so the proconsul was really very high, and uh, they were brought before the tribunal, which would have been the local judgment seat where Gallio would have presided. And now they uh, have also met the next ruler of the synagogue a year and a half later, and that's Sosthenes. They were accompanied by Paul, they accompanied Paul to Sincrea, where they would have met Phoebe. They <coughs> spent a great deal of time at Ephesus, would have met all the Christians there, remained there after Paul left, so they got to know them intimately. They met Apollos at Ephesus, who was also well connected. And much later, Timothy was apparently in Ephesus because he was told to greet them, along with Onesephorus. <coughs> So here's a list of Christians that they would have met. Phoebe and Sincrea, Paulus and Onesiphorus much later in Ephesus, and the Roman 16 list of people, which included Phoebe, who carried, apparently accompanied the letter at least, if she didn't carry it herself to Rome. And then this laundry list of other people and if you ever look at these lists, some of the names are really curious. Um, who is er the family of Aristobulus? Is this the Aristobulus who was a ruler over Judea years ago? Or is this just somebody who's named after him? Apparently a Jew, since he's named after somebody with a strong Jewish background. Narcissus, we don't name our kids that anymore for some reason. Um, <laughs> We got the, the uh, Triff twins, the Triffina and Trifosa, um, both females. Their names mean dainty and delicate. <laughs> um, and then a group of people, and it lists these people and it says the brothers with them. So I don't know whether this is a, another traveling group or if this is another local assembly that met near nearby the city of Rome that they would have that, that, that they would have uh, known. Okay, we've got a Hermes and a Hermes here. We've got a, a, syncretus, a, a syncretus, who apparently claps out of time. I'm sorry, that would be asynchronous, wouldn't it? Uh, sorry. Um, and then we have another group. We've got 
this group um, and all the saints with them. So we have these little subgroups connected to the church in Rome that they're told to greet. And I just find that fascinating. You know, we, we kind of think of meetings in homes as being the odd thing now. In fact, there are some people who just that are freaked out when if you ever use the word house church, they say, is that okay? Well, you know, apparently it was more common to have little groups like this meeting close by in a, a big city than it was to have, you know, to than the, the big groups themselves. Because here you have one group in Rome that's connected with at least three others. You've got these two two groups and the then the group that's meeting in in uh, Priscilla and Aquila's house. So this is a lot of connections for these two just in the city of Rome. Not to mention the assemblies of the saints in Corinth, Sincrea, Ephesus, and Rome. Then all the assemblies of the Gentiles and the assembly in their house. Wow. Mm -hmm. So they had connections with a lot of the early churches. There was probably not, there were probably not many names that were better known than Aquila and Priscilla anywhere throughout the <coughs> churches in Asia. And these other assemblies are groups that are brought out in Rome. All right. Points to ponder. What occurs to you all about these two? Carrie? It's interesting to me that they, when they were traveling with Paul, they remained behind at Ephesus. And they were right in the right spot when Apollo showed up. Uh -huh. And, uh, and it, it looks providential that... Uh, that they had the influence on Apollos who went on to have such a profound influence in yeah. the church at that time. Yeah, and we're, because we're going to talk about Apollos shortly, I won't say too much about that now, but wow, what a powerhouse he apparently was. So, um, yeah, mm -hmm. fortuitous at least and probably providential that they knew each other. What else? Of course, we know God's hand was in all of this because if it, if it had not been, how could this have happened? You went from one guy dying in Jerusalem and within just a few decades, everyone in all of the Roman Empire and probably well beyond the Roman Empire has heard of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It says their sound went out into all the earth. Quite know what that means, but you know it's big. It influenced a lot of people. Huge influence on a lot of people. What else? Most people observe something about the fact that the two of them are always mentioned together. So this was a joint enterprise between the two of them. You don't see one without the other. Uh, so they're example of a co-teaching couple. Um, Paul refers to both of them as his co-workers. Little, little uh, doubt that Priscilla was deeply involved in the work. And a lot of people have taken note that her name is five times out of seven that they're mentioned together. Her name is mentioned first. And that might not be so noticeable to us, but apparently in the Greek and Roman era, that would be extremely rare for a woman's name to be mentioned before the men. It has caused a lot of writers to speculate that perhaps between the two of them, she was the more involved. Don't know if that's true or not. It's just speculation. Were they sisters? Who? Priscilla and Aquila. They were husband and wife. Oh. They're the only known couple who traveled extensively with a missionary group. It may have been true of other couples as well, but they're the only ones that we know of. We know in the host of people that traveled with Paul, there were probably many other married men, and we know that Phoebe was a co-worker of his, and that he references many women who were involved in the work. But this is the only couple, as far as I know, that we know of for sure that traveled extensively with Paul. Their first consideration was for the work of the Lord. Um, they left Rome, and they show up in Corinth, and where do you find them? 
meeting with Christians and with Paul. Bruce? I'm just wondering if you could think of social or cultural reasons why it might have been to Paul's benefit as a single person, unmarried, to do so much traveling with a married couple. Mm. <clears throat> Just thinking about how he might be received in places where he was at first unknown. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to draw from my own experience, uh, having traveled quite a bit on mission trips myself, and I can say that there are a lot of awkward situations that you might be placed in um, if you were asked to teach a woman by herself, or if a woman wanted to tell you something very private and intimate about her life. How critical it would be to have a woman present at least to participate in that. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I, I've had some uh, women over the years who've told me some things that they never told anybody else and uh, very private things about, you know, things that had happened to them in their past or whatever. And if there hadn't been a woman involved in the mission trip, uh, that conversation could not have taken place. I also think that, I mean, we're taught that the relationship between Christ and the church is a husband and wife. Well, with Paul being able to intimately travel with a husband and wife helps him understand that relationship and that correlation. Okay. So I think that's just a, another, like, side note of God having this happen. Yeah, and as an aside, he wrote that to the Ephesians, and she was a fixture, this couple was a fixture there in Ephesus. So, if you're right, that would have been... A, good object lesson for the people he was teaching. Okay, good. What else? Well, going back to what you're saying, that they had, if they had to leave Rome, but what did they start doing? I mean, how would we feel if all of a sudden we got kicked out of our home? Mm -hmm. Would we go somewhere in Ottawa and start preaching God's word? Yeah. Or would and we then they went with Paul to Ephesus and he left them there. Right. And, and you know, it was... It was there that they immediately, we know that they started teaching again immediately because that's where they met Apollos. So that's my question. Are we ready? If that happens to us, are we ready to do that right now? If yeah. we had to be moved right now, are we ready to go preach God's word where we have to move to? Very good. Good good question. So they, they were willing to do the Lord's work wherever the Lord took them. And he took them to lots of places. Good. Anybody else? Good points. Thank you. Ready to move on to Apollos? How are we doing for time? We got a little time. Yet. Okay, so here are the texts. <clears throat> Apollos is mentioned in Acts, as we just read. The latter part of that chapter, beginning in verse 24 and on through 19 and verse 1. They are mentioned, Apollos is mentioned again in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 12 as the center of controversy there, or not the center of controversy, but um, there was some controversy that included his name popping up. Uh, and that is not only in chapter 1, verse 12, but Paul actually talks about that quite a lot in chapters 3 and 4 as well. He uses himself and Apollos as an example to talk about how um, they were just tools for the Lord to use in the churches that they served. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 12, he's mentioned, and in Titus chapter 3, verse 13. We don't get a lot of information from those latter two texts, but uh, the information that we get tells us more about the people that they're connected with. Okay, so in Acts chapter 18, um, first thing we find out about Apollos is that he's a Jew. He has a decidedly Greek name. He's named after a Greek god. In fact, um, and uh, that he's from the city of Alexandria, which was a Roman now. It's a Roman city in Egypt, North Africa, and, uh, and uh, a center of learning. There are a lot of Jews in Alexandria. There was a huge Jewish population, and there are a lot of documents that come from Alexandria that are Jewish in their origin. Um, big, well-established Hellenistic Jewish community, which would explain why he's a 
Jew who has a Greek name, clearly a Hellenist by background. He was first encountered in Ephesus. He was competent in the scriptures. What do, you, what do we mean when we say he's competent in the scriptures? What scriptures were there at this time? The Old Testament. Okay, he's talking about the Old Testament. We don't, when we think of competent in the scriptures, we automatically, our minds go to the New Testament. No, Apollos, Apollos was well-schooled in the Jewish way of thinking. And so he was very competent in the Old Testament scriptures, as Paul was. Probably not to the extent that Paul was, for sure. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, Paul talks about certain Jews who were not well-schooled, who thought they knew something. This is a guy who really did. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, in verse 25. He was fervent in spirit. He taught accurately concerning Jesus. But, knew only the baptism of John. And that's a big but, isn't it? You, you know all about Jesus. Or you, you, you know accurately all the things concerning Jesus, but only know the baptism of John. And we know that there was another case where some people were instructed to be baptized again because they had only received the baptism of John and had not received the Holy Spirit. He spoke boldly in the synagogue in verse 26. Priscilla and Aquila took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And then uh, in chapter 18 still, he received letters of commendation from the brethren at Ephesus to go to Corinth and, and teach them as well. And it says he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. So he was a great morale booster to the people who, the young fledgling Christians who were coming along in Corinth. For Corinth being in Achaia, of course. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. I would like to have been there for that lesson, wouldn't you? Did you do that? Show from the scriptures, and of course we're still talking about the Old Testament. Show from the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. And he spent some time in Corinth in chapter 19, verse 1, we're told. In 1 Corinthians, there was, Apollos had become a source of com competition and quarreling among the brethren there. Some were saying, I, I'm of Paul, I'm, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, Peter, or I am of Christ. Um, who baptized you? Does it matter? <clears throat> to them, it seemed to have mattered too much to the extent that they were battling back and forth over who was greater because of who had baptized them. Paul said, I'm thankful that I didn't baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. Gaius. Those were names that, were, that we mentioned as, as uh, having been acquainted, acquaintances of Priscilla and Aquila. <clears throat> Paul said, I planted. Apollos did come in behind Paul and visited many of the churches that Paul had visited, apparently with Paul's blessing. Paul planted, Apollos watered, but it's God who gives the increase. So he says it's neither him, him who plants nor him who waters, but it is God who gives the increase. That you may learn by us that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against the other. None of them were baptized by Jesus, but they were all followers of Jesus. And so it was Jesus who was preeminent, not Apollos or Paul. <clears throat> and this, just a blurb that we read about Apollos in chapter 16, verse 12, might tell you a little bit about Apollos. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to visit you with the other brothers, but it was not at all his will to come now. <laughs> so he will come when he has opportunity. So Paul's twisting his arm. He says, I ain't going. <laughs> it's not at all my will to do that. <clears throat> 
And then Titus chapter 3 and verse 13. Titus was in Crete, see 1 and 5. Paulus was present, verse 13. He was in the company of one Zenus, the lawyer. Now, presumably this would have been a Jewish lawyer. This would have been someone else who was also uh, heavily schooled in Jewish law. So can you imagine he and Paulus, Apollos together, going around to these Gentile Christians, Gentile churches and Gentile areas where there are Jews present and confounding these Jews, telling them that Jesus was the Messiah of the, that they had read about in, their, in the Old Covenant. <clears throat> must have been, they, the two of them together must have been a powerful force. And Titus was told to be sure that they had everything that they needed. So, people connections. Alexandria was his hometown. We don't read anything about a church in Alexandria in the New Testament. But there are early references, as early as first century, that connect John Mark with a church in Alexandria. Apparently he evangelized there. And there are three major branches of the Orthodox denomination, the Coptic Church, the uh, Orthodox Church of, North, of, of Africa, and the Orthodox Church of the Orient. All three claim that their home church is Alexandria and that John Mark was the evangelist that they uh, assigned the, the, the start of that church to. Is it true or not? Can't prove it, but boy, there sure, sure are some awfully early references to it. So this is where he comes from, and if there was a church there, he surely knew about it. He was well known in Ephesus, somewhat of an icon to Corinth, and in Crete with Titus. So what do we learn from Apollos? Yeah. You can uh, get a little bit of a measure of the shrewdness of um, Aquila and Priscilla, as well as kind of the temperament of Apollos when you look at their introduction or this conversation they have, is that he's teaching accurately what he knows, but he's lacking a bit more of the big picture. Mm -hmm. And Aquila and Priscilla, instead of throwing the baby out with the bathwater and saying, well, this guy clearly doesn't know the Jesus we know, they decide to take him aside and teach him not correctively, but more accurately, mm -hmm. providing him more of a picture kind of similar to Paul, who was very versed in the Hebrew scriptures, knew of a Messiah, just didn't know who that Messiah was. And so they do that, and they're very shrewd, and it seems like they did that with the correct, um, you know, love and um, attitude. And then Apollos seems to take it pretty well, is, seems to be grateful for this uh, instruction and this additional information. And it was a mutually beneficial thing for the church that this happened because Apollos you know, goes on to become a very uh, hard worker for the church and does a lot of great work. Yeah, that's a really good point. Sometimes it, it's the people who know the most that are the hardest to convince of anything. Well, part of the problem is because they think they know, <laughs> they, they know too much. So Apollos, uh, we, we, uh, we cer certainly see something of his character in this. and apparently of the effectiveness of Priscilla and Aquila in dealing with him. Absolutely, thank you. What else? Yes, sir. Uh, Short back to the Iraq War, uh, I was reading some uh, things some of the soldiers wrote and experienced while in Iraq. And some of them came was down in the area about 60 miles uh, south of uh, east, I believe, of Baghdad, and it's where in the area of uh, Babylon, that are ruins. Yes. And they came across a group of people that they said was teaching John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. Teaching. And you just think that out, I mean, you're 2,000 years they're still teaching John, John the Baptist. Teaching. Okay, they needed an Apollos, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's quickly list a few things about him. There's place for scholarship and oratory, absent any inspiration, per se. We, Apollos clearly wasn't inspired by God to say the things that he said. He was just well-schooled, and he was a great orator, and he was really good at convincing people. Um, maintain humility, knowing your knowledge is imperfect. We all have imperfect knowledge. None of us are inspired. So we need to 
bear that in mind anytime we speak, that there is more that we don't know, no matter how much we think we know, there's always more that we don't. And more that we don't know than there is that we do. So it's okay to be bold, but also be malleable. In James chapter 3, verse 17, and Philippians 4, 5, James 3, 17 talks about being easily entreated. Apollos was apparently like that. He could be convinced, his mind could be changed. And Philippians chapter 4 and verse 5 says, Let your reasonableness be known to all men. Let everybody know how reasonable you are. You can talk to me, I'm reasonable. That's, what he, that's the kind of attitude we should have. Thank you.